Cardona escaped the cage of answers at about the age of 15. Growing up in Malta in a highly uh, defined Catholic environment, he uh, wanted more. And so he entered into a life of curiosity. And he came to Canada. Now, I gotta know as an aside, what's, how did we start slipping up in the US? All these guys are going to Canada. What, 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 it's, it's, yeah, I mean, I like Canada, I, I, I'm, I'm glad, but, but come on, really? Because we're Muslims, we're hockey players. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, he's in Vancouver now, and that's still pretty close to the uh, U.S. there, okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll grant him that, hey, in between Alaska and, and Washington. Uh, but uh, the former editor of the journal Aeon, co-editor of the journal Kronos, author of uh, many books, four of which are available here on our, uh, at our bookstore, and they are excellent, really fascinating. So uh, this morning, uh, Duardo is going to pick up where he left off last year. Welcome, Duardo Cardona. Thank you. Actually, I had no idea when I prepared the talk I am about to give that my good friend, Wallace Thornhill, would be presenting a paper that touches on exactly the same series of events that I am about to discuss, which he did yesterday morning. That said, however, it does indicate, actually it stresses the importance of the events in question. As pointed out in the paper I read at last year's conference, there are still those on Earth who are adamant in stating that the sun that shone above the heads of their ancestors was not the present one. And judging by the way it is described in mankind's universal mytho-historical record, the ancient sun that shone above our ancient ancestors' heads appears to have been much too close, even if somewhat dim, and yet exceptionally warm for it to have been the one that presently shines above our heads. What such a sun best fits is what is known as a brown dwarf star. There was a time when brown dwarfs were believed to fail as stars because their low mass prohibits them from attaining internal nuclear reactions. But if astronomical bodies achieve their stellar qualities through spatial electrical energy, bodies with lesser mass than normal stars could still exhibit astral characteristics, even if in a minor way. As it is, brown dwarf stars have now been found to be produced in all possible masses between planets and stars. By the end of 2004, it could be additionally reported that there's no longer any doubt that these substellar objects exist throughout the galaxy, numbering as much as 100 billion members. In fact, brown dwarf stars are as common as stars. And not only do brown dwarf stars look like stars, they behave like stars as well. On the basis of detections by the Hubble Space Telescope, the conclusion has now been reached that brown dwarfs form the same way stars do. In fact, they are presently considered to be bona fide stars. There are various, incidentally, uh, mythological expositions from around the world that proclaim the manner in which God's creation is said to have unfolded. In quite a few of these narratives, we come across an attempted elucidation of a mysterious substance that seems to have existed before whatever God comments to create whatever it was said that he created. In the biblical book of Genesis, this entity is described as tohu wahbohu which is traditionally translated as without form and void, or void and empty, but which better translates as utter chaos. And it was out of this very chaos that God is said to have organized whatever it was that he created. This belief, incidentally, is not unique to the Old Testament. It was no different among the classical Greeks, as recounted by no other than Hesiod. The Chinese called this chaos Tao, describing it as having not only been chaotic, but also nebulous in its nature, while it constantly revolved. 
To the Yuki Amerans, it was an indistinct something that they likened to fog and or foam that will drown and round continually. A similar primordial foggy substance is also mentioned in oceanic mythology, while the Pima compared it to a fluffy bit of cotton that drifted to and fro. Others compared their material to a stretch of whirling slime or mud, an eddying of waters, a whirling ocean in the sky. One could brush these descriptions aside as being nothing but the mythological ravings that would have originated in early man's ignorance of nature. And, to be sure, I myself was somewhat confused as to what these mythological reports were alluding to, until I happened to glance at one of Chesley Bonnestell's paintings, illustrating the placental cloud of matter surrounding Earth in its early formative period. Needless to say, man could not have been around during that early time on Earth, so he could not have based his reports on that manifestation. However, similar so-called placental clouds, now referred to as circumstellar disks, are also known to girdle stars. Could ancient man have seen such a circumstellar disk swirling around Earth's previous stellar host? Do brown dwarfs even harbor such disks? In 2001, a team from the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics discovered what they termed warm, dusty disks around some of the free-floating dwarf stars that were by then being detected in never-growing numbers. A year later, gas and dust disks around substellar objects were being written about as a matter of fact. And, to be sure, as time went by, more than 100 brown dwarf stars were discovered in the Orion Nebula alone, 60% of which turned out to be surrounded by nebulous clouds of warm dust. That such this encircle brown dwarf stars is not universally accepted. More than half the brown dwarf stars that have been discovered display such disks. And the friction may be as high as 80%. In fact, brown dwarfs are girdled by disks just as often as stars are while their disks have been calculated to last just as long. As is usual in such cases, astronomers were astonished, not to say perplexed, that these disks behave so much like the ones around much more massive newly forming stars. In the meantime, modern mythologists should not be blamed for being at a loss in attempting to understand what our forefathers were alluding to. Given the nebulosity of such a disk, to say nothing of the difficulty it must have presented in being compared to terrestrial substances, the vagueness of its various descriptions is understandable. Even so, judging by the overly dusty and gaseous nature of such disks, it is hardly surprising that ancient man would have described the one seen around Earth's primordial sun as a nebulous substance comparable to fog foam, fluff, eddying slime, or mud, all of which have been added to what was later simply alluded to as a chaotic substance. In addition to this circumstantial cloud, ancient societies also described what appeared to them as a twirling column of wind associated with that very cloud. This can be gleaned all the way from the beliefs of the Canaanites across those of the Egyptians to Buddhist countries the Americas, as well as the South Pacific. Not only was the wind described as having been cyclonic in nature, but to have also acted as a column supporting the sky. Such, for instance, was the Egyptian shoe, as well as the Mesoamerican Hecatl. Since this columnar entity was seen emanating from Earth's primeval sun, it was also thought of as the celestial god's single leg as in the Hindu case of the one-footed Brahma, but also Vishnu and the Turumbulun of the Australian Aborigines. To others, this appendage was remembered as God's supporting phallus that was also surprisingly described as the downward flow of light from above. The most descriptive aspect of this appendage, however, was as a sky pillar that has gone down among mythologists as the axis mundi concerning which entire books can be written. Additional to that was the associated 
description of the cyclonic wind, single leg, phallus, and other items as having had the appearance of a whirling ray from above. What could this brilliant whirling ray have been? There has been, as there continues to be, more than one interpretation of the effulgent, effulgent ray of light that ancient man saw stretching between the primordial sun above him and the land beneath his feet. One of these was Ralph Jurgens, whose theory that the column-like structure might have been in the nature of a steady electric discharge. As time went by, Jurgens' concept was lent validity through the discovery of so-called astral jets of plasma that are ejected by galaxies, as well as stars, along the rotational axis. One can argue that the colossal size of these jets would eliminate their possible occurrence in association with the much less massive brown dwarf stars. But as I reasoned right from the start, if these jets can stretch in size between galactic and stellar magnitudes, the difference in size of which is enormous, what would keep them from existing in lesser dimensions? After all, the difference in scale between brown dwarfs and regular stars is much less than that between stars and galaxies. Or if brown dwarf stars can be surrounded by a scaled-down version of a circumstellar disk, why cannot they emit a scaled-down version of a stellar jet? Wallace Thornhill, who was not adverse to this concept, indicated that this jet would have been a sustained plasma discharge in the form of Birkeland current, which claim was upheld by the plasma physicist Anthony Peratt. The problem with all this stemmed from the fact that at the time I came to this conclusion, jetting brown dwarf stars were still unknown. And yet, when I discussed this problem with the astrophysicist Doug Lynn, his verdict was that jets from brown dwarf stars were not only possible, but very probable. Lynn's privately tendered personal opinion was the probability less than a year after he had voiced it when spectral lines that are normally observed in stellar jets were actually detected in brown dwarf stars. As time went by, other than spectral lines, actual jets, and even violent ones, were depicted spouting from these brown dwarf stars. As Emma Whelan from the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies has stated, jets are confirmed to flow from a huge range of objects, from the largest galaxies to tiny brown dwarf stars. Meanwhile, the brown dwarf stars can be accompanied by planets was proven in 2005 when a planet was actually imaged in association with such a brown dwarf star. Not long after that, more of the same came to light. Not only that, but an entire planetary system was eventually detected forming around a brown dwarf that is barely larger than a giant planet. There is therefore nothing strange in Earth having once been the protege of a brown dwarf star. As those who are familiar with the thesis I am here submitting know, Earth's primordial brown dwarf star eventually turned into the gaseous planet we now know as Saturn. And yes, I do realize that those who are not familiar with the astronomical evidence that backs this up will find it hard to accept. That Earth had formerly been a satellite of the proto-Saturnian body was first hinted at by Oskar Reichenbach in 1884 before it was taken up by Emanuel Belkovsky in 1971. And that, planetary, and that the planetary Saturn had originally been deified and adored as mankind's supreme god all over the ancient world was magnificently documented by David Talbot during the same decade. Indeed, as Talbot stated, the consistency with which early astronomers Identify Saturn as the former creator king is extraordinary. As he reported concerning his research of Earth's primordial catastrophic history, quote, nothing came as a greater surprise to me than the sheer quantity of material bearing directly on the Saturnian tradition. And as I myself discovered during my own investigations of the same traditions, the Saturnian deity kept showing up in every myth or historical avenue that I followed, despite the fact that I actually tried very hard to get away from him. 
because of a major event, a turning point in Earth's cosmic history, to which I shall get to in a while, it was posited by Jurgens that Earth and its primordial proto-Saturnian stellar host had been traveling together outside the demarcation of the solar system before they were captured by our present sun. And as unusual as that may sound to some, stars are known to wander alone through space, vacating their systems and or invading others. Nor are regular stars alone in this class, since the conglomeration of these three wanderers also include brown dwarfs. Some of these dwarfs are known to orbit sun-like stars, but most of them are actually floating freely through space. And free-floating sub-brown dwarfs, similar to the one posited as their primordial sun, are more numerous than their larger siblings. What, however, was it that made Jurgens theorize that Saturn and Earth had been floating outside the solar system demarcation before their capture by our present sun? As with various other matters, this too was based by Jurgens on yet another concept that had been proposed by Velikovsky. As Velikovsky had it stated in an almost offhand manner back in mid-1973, Saturn had somehow flared up in Nova-like brilliance. It is unfortunate that Velikovsky misplaced the event in time, placing proto-Saturn's flare-up just ahead of what has come down to us as Noah's deluge, when there is much better evidence for placing it some 5,000 years earlier during that primeval event that lit up the sky for the very first time during mankind's sojourn on Earth. In the book of Genesis, this event came to pass when Elohim gave the order to let there be light. But let this not be thought of as a unique biblical event. On the contrary, the sudden shedding of light into what had been a somewhat darkened world is described in various ways in the mytho-historical records of just about all ancient nations from Mesopotamia and the rest of the Near East India and the Far East, including China, into Egypt, down through Africa, Greece and Rome, North America, and across the stormy seas to the islands in their midst. As far as Jurgens was concerned, the sudden flare-up resulted when the sun captured the proto-Saturnian system, including Earth, into its electrical domain. Thus, according to him, Proto-Saturn's discharge was diverted to the new ru ruling body, since Proto-Saturn found itself much too highly charged for its altered environment. This concept was later taken up by Wallace Thornhill, who pointed out that Proto-Saturn's entry into the solar plasmasphere, plasmasphere would have required rapid adjustment by the intruder to the new electrical environment where the sun was the main focus of electrical activity. So, likewise, Donald Scott, when he spoke of bodies like proto-Saturn and the sun possessing different inherent voltages, thus he tells us that when the plasma spheres of such bodies come in contact with one another, an electric current in the form of an arc discharge will fly between them to the detriment of the lower voltage body. In the case in question, the lower voltage body was proto-Saturn. Our primordial sun flared up in a brilliant, blinding light that went down in metal history as day one. But can brown dwarfs really flare? You bet they can and do. Very much like bona fide stars, brown dwarfs also have a ten tendency to flare up. The brightness produced by their X-ray emissions during these outbursts were originally considered hard to believe and said to have shocked scientists. Such rays have even been detected from what are considered to be lightweight brown dwarfs. Strong radio waves spiking at 10,000 times stronger than what astronomers thought possible, indicating flare energies that have actually been compared to those emitted by the sun have also been detected from these stellar dwarfs. There is an awful lot of metahistorical material indicating the creative outflow emitted by the proto-Saturnian flare-up. As in other matters, throughout the world, we come across this outflow as having actually spiraled out across the sky. 
as in other matters, it is not easy to get away from what has gone down in mythology as the spiral of creation. And here, once again, we find that on a much larger scale, eruptive material from supernovae has a tendency to expel electromagnetic detritus in vast widening spiraling streams, as can be seen in the eruptive matter expelled by the giant red star known as R. Sculptoris. While as a sub-round dwarf, Protostatus' discharge would have been nowhere as close to that of a supernova, it should be kept in mind that within the restrictions of certain parameters, plasmatic occurrences can be scaled up or down from microcosmic to macrocosmic extents without losing their intrinsic behavior. It therefore seems that what our ancient forebears described to have seen spiraling out across the sky was an accurate report of what was actually transpiring at the time. That the planet Saturn is the end result of brown dwarf degeneration has more than been implied by orthodoxy. As Glenn Schneider opined, quote, given a billion years of cooling and evolution, and these objects may be indistinguishable from planets. Or, as Maria Zapatero Osorio stated, with time, brown dwarfs will look like Jupiter and Saturn. As for the billion years required for such a devolution, how about that monster of a protostar in the Cepheus constellation that has been claimed by astronomers to be able to develop into a high mass star in about a mere 10,000 years? Coincidentally or not, 10,000 years is precisely the amount of time Sam Flamsteed claimed it would take a brown dwarf star to turn into a Jupiter or Saturn-sized planet. In fact, let us be quite honest. As it has been pointed out, the line between planets and brown dwarfs is rather blurred. At present, the planet Saturn radiates more heat than it receives from the sun. Its total heat emission has been calculated to be about two or three times the solar energy it actually receives. And as it has been claimed, an actual internal heat source is definitely called for. At present, it is believed that helium percolating toward the core is responsible for this excess heat that has turned Saturn into a world that is hotter than it should be. But in view of what the ancients had to say, it is more than probable that Saturn's excess heat is a residue from when it radiated as Earth's primordial sun. Besides its excess heat, Saturn also shines with its own light, at least to an extent. As low as its illumination is, its glow, which has been likened to a Chinese lantern, is sufficient to backlight the planet's clouds. But let us cut straight across the lawn that the planet Saturn is the relic of what had previously been a brown dwarf star is now an accepted tenet of mainstream astronomy. And there are indications, or is there any evidence, that Earth did not always belong to the solar system? As a matter of fact, NASA's Genesis spacecraft made a hell of a discovery when its instruments revealed that the solar system's inner planets, including Earth, do not contain the same ratios of oxygen and nitrogen as the Sun, while the interstellar boundary explorer found that the gases contained within the entire solar system are different from those outside its boundaries. What all this and other evidence has been interpreted to mean is that the solar system, including Earth, came into being in a different part of the galaxy than the one in which it presently located. More importantly, however, the Genesis spacecraft readings imply that Earth could not have formed out of the same nebulous material that is thought to have created the Sun. What all this boils down to is that, while the Sun seems to have shifted its location within the Milky Way galaxy, some of its members, including Earth, had to have been captured into its chaotic family even later. As it happens, and this is not at all surprising, our ancient forefathers have been telling us that long, long ago, the sun was young, the present sun was young, and no bigger than a star. They continue to tell us that as time, they continue to tell of the time when the sun was originally very small, 
hardly a nail's breadth across. But, as they also said, one day it suddenly began to grow till it was a span across. One interesting point about this report is that the sun, the present sun, was not merely remembered as having been smaller than it is at present, or that it grew in size, but that it was known that this resulted because it had actually still been far away. It therefore seems that our ancient ancestors were not exaggerating in their descriptions of these primordial events. So please, let us pay attention to what they have recorded. Thank you for listening. <laughs>